One of the perplexing things we face as church leaders is that most church people don't know what the church is or why it exists. Granted, that's partly our fault. But with 2,000 years of history under our belts, we should be further along. Ask the average person what comes to mind when he or she hears the term church, and and you'll get all kinds of answers. A building, a weekend event, the longest hour of the week, arguing with my parents on Sunday morning, arguing with my kids on Sunday morning. If you know your church history, you are painfully aware that once the church was legalized, it got organized, excruciatingly organized. What began as unexplainable became institutional. Before long, the church was less about movement and more about establishment. 2,000 years later, the church is struggling to regain its original identity, purpose, and passion. This is a second week in a series called Growing Deep and Wide, based on Andy Stanley's book, uh, Deep and Wide, Creating Churches That Unchurched People Love to Attend. Now, I got a question. If I were to gather all the Christians... All the Christians across our city. So anyone who believes in Jesus, anyone, like, doesn't matter what church they go to, any denomination, any fellowship, any network, and we gathered them all down at Shipyards Park. So got them all together, one big group, and be a great big family reunion. And if I were to go to the top of the hill and I get a megaphone, and I were to say, who wants to reach the next generation for Jesus? How many hands do you think would go up? A lot? Just about 100%. Probably a lot of them would say, they would probably say, we want the next generation to embrace Jesus, to embrace the church, uh, you know, to carry on Christian tradition. They probably desire that. They want that. But then in the subsequent question, if I were to say, what's the faith of the next generation worth? What's it worth to you? What are you willing to lay down or give up to see the next generation embrace the church? Because the next generation isn't opposed to Jesus. The next generation isn't opposed to faith or spirituality or even Christianity. But the next generation is very opposed to the church. So if we were to ask, if I were to say here, okay, who's willing to give up everything? All your preferences, all your opinions, all your traditions. Who's willing to lay it all down to reach the next generation for Jesus? I have a feeling that not so many hands would go up. In fact, if we're, we need to ask ourselves, if we're willing, what are we willing to to see the next generation? What are we willing to give up? What are we willing to embrace to see the next generation embrace the church and really lead the church into the next generation? Now, Andy Stanley gives a lot of American stats in the book, and we're Canadian. And so we need to consider some of the next generation research if we're really going to, uh, if we're going to get to the bottom of maybe this question, because maybe some of you are kind of skeptical and you're like, ah, things are fine in the church. There's lots of, all churches are full of young people. I don't know what your problem is. That's what I see anyway. I don't think there's really a problem. Well, let's establish if there is a problem. And uh, there's an amazing organization called the New Leaf Network. Now, on your way out today, I'm going to give a couple of quick stats, but if it's going too quick for you, it's all good. We, there's, a, there's a PDF you can download, download at newleafnetwork.ca, or we've got printed copies on your way out if you'd like the deeper stats, more information, where we have a, we have a printed copy, front and side, single page, for you to check out if you want to know more. So let's look at some of the stats for Canada. First, the New Leaf Network. At New Leaf, we want to help the Canadian church discover new potential. That's their journey. That's their trying. They do a lot of research, uh, statistics. And uh, according to New Leaf, you know, in 1975 is when things kind of started to shift. Up until 1975, Christianity was like the majority in Canada for like since its existence. And in 1975, stats were that 88% of people in Canada were Christian, 4% other religions, and 8% no affiliation. So if we had 10 people standing up here in 1975, random people, 
nine, or just under nine of those people would be Christian. They, they believe that Jesus is the son of God. They go to church of some sort, or they might not go to church regularly, regularly but they would state themselves in a survey, they would state that they're Christian. Now, what did culture look like? It's, it's interesting. I was talking to my mom about this. Um, it is Mother's Day, right? So got to have a good long conversation this week with mom. And I work on Mother's Day all the time and she's away. I don't get much time to call her. I could live call her now. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? No. Okay. So having a long conversation with mom saying, hey, when you first came over before you had, what was life like? Because she came over from England in 1976. I was born in 79. What was it like kind of coming into Canadian culture? And she validated that Canadian culture in 1976 when she landed was really Christian. Like when she went to work, everyone kind of knew who Jesus was. If you asked who Jesus was, everyone was like, well, he's a son of God. It was pretty common knowledge. Even, even those that didn't go to church, they were okay with Jesus. They were, they were okay. They'd go to church on occasions. Uh, Mother's Day was a big one for everyone to go to church. And keep in mind, in culture too, at that time, my mom was saying that like nothing was open on Sundays. You had church or you stayed at home. There wasn't a lot of options to do stuff on Sunday morning. And and so that was built in the culture. And she said, I remember like if we had uh, assemblies or public gatherings, the Lord's Prayer, and in case you don't know what the Lord's Prayer is, there's a prayer that Jesus gives and trying to teach people how to pray in the Gospels. And it's often referred to as the Lord's Prayer, Jesus' Prayer. And so the Lord's Prayer was given a lot of times. Like you would just hear it in public. It was a common thing. And, and so I was asking the elders too, what was it like at that time? And Nick uh, Leanders, one of our elders, the treasurer, he was recalling that he remembers looking through his school yearbook. Now that was from the 60s, but the same trend went through the early 70s. And he noticed that on all the girls' uh, kind of pictures in the, in the yearbook, they would always put CGIT. And so it would be like, you know, Mary, and then she'd have her little comment, and at the end, CGIT. And every girl as you went, it was always CGIT. And this was a public school. And, and he remembered, like, that was a big thing then. And it, meant, it stood for, it was like kind of the like, text talk before text messaging. CGIT was Christian Girls in Training. And this was a regular thing in this public school that you would put this. It was popular to be on a journey to become a Christian girl, a Christian girl in training. So this is the culture then. But things started to shift at around 1975, continued through the 80s, 90s, through the new millennium. By 2011, a hu- another huge study was done. And by then, Christianity had sunk to 66% in Canada. Other religions had rose to 11. But catch this, no affiliation, no religious affiliation rose from 8% to 23%. And if we look at the Christian uh, statistics, and then we look at the rise in 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 uh, other religions, maybe you'll say, oh, well, there was immigration. We were a, more, we're a more diverse country now. And that's true. There's some of that. But the no affiliation, one of the greatest builds to the no affiliation is actually previously Christian. That if you were to look at those no affi- non-affiliates and you were to say, if you would ask them to do a survey, what's your, Christ- what's your parents' faith? They would check off Christian. So there there was an exodus starting to happen, and it has continued. Now, uh, in uh, current research only shows about 24% non-affiliation. And you say, oh, well, in eight years, seven, eight years, nine years, currently there's only 1% increase. No big deal. However, when you isolate the millennial generation from uh, born in 1980 to 2000, that demographic, that is actually rose and continues to rise. It's at 35%. So a huge majority of the non-affiliates are are millennials, and that is climbing. Now, Generation Z, which is 2001 and up, verdict's still out on that. We don't really know, but statistics show that it is climbing. Um, a large uh, study was done. It was called the Hemorrhaging Faith Study, and it was done by the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. And depending on the grouping, because uh, rural tends to be more Christian than urban, uh, East Coast tends to be more Christian than West Coast. So depending on the, on the different groupings, but either way, there was a decline that in all Canadian churches are losing anywhere between 60 and 90%, depending on the, on the area and the grouping of young people by early adulthood. So, you're probably thinking, well, look at Jeremy. He's been really encouraging on Mother's Day. (sighs) 
we kind of have a choice. We, it's okay to ask. It's okay to, to look at the data because the data doesn't have feelings. It doesn't have emotions. It's just, this is, this is the reality we live in. And we, we have options. We could get discouraged and we could just get kind of feeling downtrodden and say, well, this is the worst. It's pointless. There's, there's nothing, uh, there's, there's no point to this. I'm just moving back. Sometimes when I get crazy, I get worried I'm going to drop off this big stage now. So when I get fired up. So you can, uh, you can get discouraged or you can get apathetic. That's an option. You can say, well, yep. Well, church was fine for me and I attended for years. And if these young people don't want church, well, that's fine. I don't want them there anyway. I'm good with it. They can do their own thing. We can, that's an option. Apathy is an option. Or we can get motivated. We can look at the raw data and we can get motivated by it and say, okay, well, let's take a deeper look into this and try to figure it out. God's given us all amazing brains. He's also giving us some young people, some 18 to 25 year olds that are choosing the church and choosing to stay in the church. Let's start bringing them into the mix. Now, you're probably thinking by now, hey, Jeremy, we're in church. Isn't it time to open the Bible? It is. Great, great question. So grab your Bibles. We're going to turn to 1 Corinthians. If you're new to church and not really used to uh, look at stuff up in the Bibles, uh, in Bibles, that's okay. There is a table of contents in the front uh, or uh, kind of a reference. The New Testament is in the last third of the Bible and 1 Corinthians is about half of the last third. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 9. Paul, the Apostle Paul, God's leading him to write to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is in all sorts of trouble. It's, it doesn't have a deep Jewish faith like some of the other areas. It has faiths from all sorts of different uh, gods and demographics and faith groups. And uh, they're struggling a lot. And Paul's trying to give them some insight. Because they come to know Jesus and there's a temptation on one side to become super legalistic and all of a sudden say, hey, you got to follow all these rules. You got to do all this. But then there's another side that's like, does that all matter? And Paul is trying to get them back centered on the gospel. That, that don't forget the goal. Don't get so caught up in church that you forget why we do what we do. And, he, and in, in chapter 9, uh, in verse 18, chapter 9, verse 18, he, he lays out this almost poetic uh, reason for why he does what he does. He writes, what then, what then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my, my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a, as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside of the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. That's a little play on Old Covenant law versus kind of New Testament grace, the law of Christ, okay? And uh, he says, that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings, now, for us to get motivated, uh, Paul, really, Paul helps us shift our approach to reach the next generation. Paul helps us shift our approach to reach the next generation. And what I mean by this is we've already started some of this. Like, I grew up in church, so I totally, like, I get it, it you know, um, sometimes, you know, it's kind of like, well, we just spent a bunch of money renovating the downstairs for our children's space, and you're like, wasn't it good enough? Like I sat in rows and watched the teacher with the flannel graph. Isn't that good enough for these kids? And if you're new to church, you know what a flannel graph is? It's okay. You're, just Google it. Your world will be opened. Here's Jesus. Okay. So 
So, and this, this is what we got, and this was good. This was good for decades. What's, what's these, these kids need these video messages now with little cartoons to teach you about Jesus. And now there's a climbing wall down there. Do we really need a climbing wall? Are they climbing for Jesus? Yes. Paul helps our approach. How are we reaching children? We, we will, we will be all things. We will do everything we can so that we might win some. If a kid comes to base camp, And he leaves with his parents, and the parents didn't really like the preacher. They're at a dilemma. Because over lunch, I know the kids are going to be like, I kind of want to go back to that church. But the preacher yells at mommy and daddy all the time. Well, but I really like it down there. And we can't can't make these kids come to know Jesus. But we can design a space as best as possible we can. We can design have our approach. We can do all things possible so that there's an environment, a dynamic environment of children so that maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit will move in their life and we might win some. And the same goes for up here. I get it. Katarina and her team, I thought, you know, they made this big old stage and the other stage was fine. And what, what, are, what kind of artsy lights are these anyway? What are these? They're not even hooked in properly. They're all wound around the bar. Right? And it's all gray and dark and dim. <laughs> Put it up ropes at the back. And just step over those ropes. <laughs> Why? Why would we do all that? It was fine the way it was. Paul tells us. It's so clear. If, if, if 18 to 25 year olds are exiting the church... If that's what we know, if they are the hardest to reach people group in Canadian culture right now, then I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel. And and you know what? An 18, 25-year-old, now let's just say maybe he's de-churched. Maybe he grew up in church and he left and he's been on a rebellious streak. And all of a sudden he's found out that it's empty. This is the classic prodigal son. And he's going to return to his faith and he's got to come back in this door. Or maybe some church door. And so what can we do? What can we design the environment so that then when, that when that young man comes in here, that he can slip in the back, the ushers can lightly remove the rope, he can sit in the back 15 minutes after it starts, No one notices, and by the last song, he slips out. Well, if he's going to follow Jesus again, he needs to be brave about it. He needs to suck it up and get in here. Maybe, or maybe not. Maybe we want to create an environment so that if his first entry, it'll be as pleasant as possible. Never mind for an unchurched person where, let's just face it, ask someone who's unchurched, Christians are a little weird. It's a little weird, this whole thing on Sunday. Karaoke and listen to a guy rant and rave. I don't know. But I don't know where else to turn. <laughs> so I thought, hey, might as well try Jesus. But at least when I come here, there's good coffee. The lights are a little dim. I can get in and get out unnoticed. Just try to figure this thing called faith out. I become all things to all people so that I might win some. So we're trying to do everything we can to reach the next generation. But we also have a theological problem that we make sure we correct. Uh, Turn now to John. John 3. Jesus gives us some clues too. Um, So the Gospels, first part of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the fourth Gospel. And we're going to go to John 3. So this is a cool situation. It's like the middle of the night and there's this religious leader, Nicodemus. And Jesus is changing him. He's witnessed Jesus' teaching, and Nicodemus, his world is crumbling. All the religious standards that he knew are are being challenged. And so he comes to Jesus at night, because he can't do it in public, or else the other Pharisees will see him and he'll get kicked out of their club. All right? So it says this, uh, verse 1, chapter 3, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these, thi- these signs that you would do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot ent- see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Sorry to bring that up on Mother's Day. It was probably, it's like a traumatic and joyful event, if you, you know. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is where Jesus helps us clarify our message to the next generation. Jesus helps us clarify our message. When I was a camp director, I would get camp applications. And as always, you know, when you're a Bible camp director, uh, both in Alberta and here, the, the kind of forms are a bit the same. There's always a question about spiritual health and, and relationship with Jesus. And I would get some applications that would state that, would, you know, when, when did you accept Christ? Or when did you become a Christian? And you would get these answers, oh, I've been a Christian my whole life. Or I was raised in a Christian home. Or uh, my parents taught me to be Christian. All sorts of answers. And, and, I, and it would cause me to go to an interview because I, and, and say, okay, talk to me about this. Talk to me about the moment you met Jesus or the moment you chose Christianity chose Jesus. And what amazed me is how many Christians applying for Bible camp, raised in the church, they couldn't answer that question. They, they're like, well, they were like, well, what do you mean? I, I've always been a Christian. So you were born into Christianity. Yes, my mom was a Christian. I was born. I became a Christian. No, you became a human being. You, you didn't, you, like, you know, oh, I was Christian in the womb. I remember, I saw the light. No, you didn't. That was birth. Okay, no, you, that's not how it happened. That's not how it works. And then, it's funny, just last week, I was having a conversation. There's a young couple in our church, uh, recently married, and I was having a conversation with a gal because they met on Christian Mingle. Uh, if you're single out there, Christian Mingle, a Christian dating site. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. And so it's a thing. And uh, so if you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus, you go on Christian Mingle, and so she went and she started talking to me. Uh, she was telling me how frustrating it was because you go through the profile, you fill out a profile, and one of them is, you know, how you became a Christian or when you accepted Jesus. These kind of questions. Same thing as a camp uh, application. And what she expressed, probably one of the most frustrating things about Christian Mingle and dating on a Christian site is three out of the four guys said, oh, I was born this way. Or I, or I like, uh, my family's Christian. Or I was raised Christian. And she would get so frustrated because here she is trying to find someone who's had a legitimate experience with Jesus and chosen for themselves, but all is they're doing is filling out this profile and they have no idea when or how they found Jesus. They were just given it. And she said only about one out of four guys actually had an answer that told the story of the moment. Now some, it's different, like raised in a Christian home, but around 11 or 12, I really started thinking about it and asking questions. And like, there are stories. Getting raised in the church isn't a bad thing, but there is a definite difference when some, when a next generation makes it their own. And so for us, we have got to get our theology in order. We, we can't just simply state all the time. We can't just simply say, oh, well, you just need to read the Bible this many times. You've got to attend church every Sunday. You gotta, if you do all that, you'll be okay. That's not true. There's generations and generations. Nicodemus, he was doing everything. He was a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee. This guy knew his stuff. And he's like, wait a second, there's something different about Jesus. There's something I'm missing. And so it's not just how we do church, it's how we're talking and teaching. Are we sharing with our children? As parents, are we being clear? There is nothing you can do to get yourself into heaven. I love it when you do good things for me. I love it when you want to read the Bible. I love it when you want to go to church. I love it that you love base camp. But I need you to know that just doing that, that doesn't get us into heaven. By just being good, it's great that you want to be good, but don't think that being good gets you into heaven. At some moment, you need to choose Jesus. Your mom and dad would love to choose Jesus for you, and we have as much as we can, but we can't get you into heaven. You have to do it on your own. But I, I'm very hopeful about the next generation when I see some of the young adults in our church. 
You know, it's interesting. I have this opportunity as a pastor often to be at, at the bedside of people when they're about to die, as well as to be pretty pretty close. Within a few days, I usually get a call and to come pray with parents of a new birth. So I get to see like both these ends. And you know, it, it's interesting. Um, if someone's old and facing death and they're in the hospital, you know, when they ask me to pray for them, they're never like, Jeremy, come close. They may be listening to organ music in the rooms, you know, some old hymns, but they're, they're not pulling me close and say, can you, can you pray that the church brings back the organ? They're not asking me that. They love that organ. Oh, they love that organ. And it's playing. I'm listening. I'm enjoying it with them. It's all good. That's their generation. I get it. It's beautiful. But that's not what they're asking when they're about to meet Jesus. Do you know what they're praying for? They're praying that their kids will come to know Jesus. That their grandparents just pray. I just pray that my children come back to church. Can you pray for that? Can, can you maybe talk to my kids? Can my grandkids, you know, can you, can you pray that they accept Jesus and know Jesus? See, when they're about to meet Jesus, they don't care about anything else. Their only desire is that the next generation embraces Christ. But what's interesting too is when I sit with parents that are in the church, that have been a part of the church, that have legitimately found Jesus, and they're, a, they're a, a day or two or a few days into being a mom or being a dad, and they're looking at this little thing, and they're just, they're in wonder and usually look terrible because they haven't got any sleep, which is always a little entertaining. Um, but, you know, when they're looking, and of course, they're over-emotional, they're, they seem to be on the edge of tears constantly, but they're never praying with me. They're never asking, oh, Jeremy, can you just lay your hands on my son and ask him to be in the NHL? <laughs> that doesn't happen. They're not, they're not asking that we pray for the kids, that they, that, that they become lawyers and doctors and that they'd be the, the best in dance or, or sports or shooting or hunting. Or, it's just not there. They're I've heard it said so many times by new parents. And this is what makes me hopeful. It's like, my, my only prayer is that they accept Je she accepts Jesus one day or he accepts Jesus one day. I don't care if she's successful or he's successful in anything else. I just, and that's when I know. That's when I know those parents, they get it. They're not, I just pray that he'll love church. They are doctrinally, theologically sound. They are locked on Jesus' words this child has been born of water, but they're not born of spirit yet. And so today, as we close, we're going to take an opportunity to respond. Uh, we're going to sing. We're going to pray. If you've given a gift to give, we'll do that. If, you, uh, if you've been thinking about serving here at Mountain View, you can go ahead and uh, you can sign up for that at the welcome desk or online. But I, I do want us to think for a moment as we go into this next song, and close out today, I want us to think, because all of us probably know a child or a niece or nephew or a grandchild that isn't following Christ or that maybe they were raised in the church and they walked away and they missed it somehow. Or, or maybe there, there are children and they just haven't made a commitment yet or our grandchildren haven't made a commitment yet. You know, and I, I don't know about you, but I, I think, I can't think of a more fitting thing to do on Mother's Day then pray for the salvation of our children and grandchildren. Because that's truly our inheritance. That's the inheritance of the kingdom. That's the gospel inheritance. If we can leave a legacy behind us of, of people who follow Christ, there, I can't think of anything greater. And so at Mountain View, we're going to continue to change our approach. We're going to continue to bring 18 to 25-year-olds into the conversation and ask them what they think. Because most of their friends and colleagues, they're in the minority. Their friends, if they've been in the church, they're walking away, or they've just never chosen it. They, that generation has the greatest loss. If, if everyone over 75 or over 65, if there was a mass exodus in the church of that demographic, we would do the same. We need to just ask difficult questions, and if we love our children and our grandchildren, if we're passionate about their relationship with Jesus, we gotta do everything we can. And the first thing is to pray. So let's pray for our kids and our grandkids. 
Dear Father, I thank you for the blessing of children and grandchildren. There is, there is <laughs> on Mother's Day, there, it is so pertinent. There is nothing greater uh, than the miracle of childbirth and bringing a child in the world. It, it is, it's miraculous that a person, a human, can grow in, inside of a mother and be born. And, and uh, they grow to be a, a separate soul, separate human, separate mind. It's, it's a miraculous thing that you've designed, and we thank you for it. But Father, we can't, as you told Nicodemus, moms, they can't give birth to Christian kids. Dads can't force kids to be, choose Jesus. But we believe in your Holy Spirit. We believe in your sovereignty. And so this morning, Lord, we take a moment and we ask. Each one of us has children and grandchildren in our mind that aren't following you, that don't know you. And so... Father, you see them, you see those names, and, and we raise them to you as individuals. We ask that the next generation would choose Jesus, that it wouldn't be based in tradition or legalism or religion, but that it would be based in an authentic following of Jesus, that they would have a true relationship with you, and they would desire to follow you. And Father, for those that maybe are in this room and don't know you, we ask that at this time they might take a moment and just profess that they believe that you sent your only son to die for us and that you, t that you sent your son to take our sin and yet your son rose again. And in the resurrection, there was conquering of death and sin. And we thank you that, for that and that <laughs> glorious ascension that, that Jesus is preparing a place for us and we believe that, and for those of us that believe it, we profess it now. And we'd ask that you'd accept our dedication that we choose to follow you. May you guide us, send your Holy Spirit to us, fill us. Father, continue to help Mountain View a Church be a church that desires to reach unchurched and de churched people people that have walked away or never walked in before. May we continue to create environments for our children and adults where someone can slip in and ask questions and explore their faith in comfort. May we always see the new face and welcome them. May we find out their needs. May we find out some of their wants and, and try to fulfill those. I thank you so much, Father, for sending your son Jesus to die for us. And thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that we know him. In Jesus' name, amen.